and you need a room for a change. Yeah. <laughs> Well, all I can say right now is last chance. There's the goal. No takers? Well, I've been told often you should always start off a, a lecture or a speech or whatever you're going to end up calling this with a little bit of humor. So I thought I would do some uh, musician's humor, especially talking about hymns today and talk about some of the hymns in our hymn book that are for professionals. And first, I'll start out with uh, any takers on what might be the hymn for tailors and seamstresses. Well, you'll be singing it in just a few minutes. Holy, holy, holy. <laughs> <laughs> or uh, a hymn for somebody who works for the IRS. All to thee. <laughs> I like this one. Uh, the dentist's hymn. Oh, come on. Nobody? <laughs> Crown him with many crowns. <laughs> I love this one because uh, I, may, I may be talking about this a little later. The librarian's hymn. Let all mortal flesh keep silence. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's enough of that. I'm just trying to figure out how I'm going to do a three-hour semester year-long course in 30 minutes. But what I want to do before we just talk about the individual stories of our hymns, I want to talk about where music in the church comes from. And I do want you to be aware that much of the information you're about to hear comes from an article that was written by Bob Coughlin titled The History of Congregational Worship. Now, there is no doubt that as long as there has been Christianity, there has been singing in church. The Bible is full, full of hymns in both the Old and the New Testament. I mean, we all know this. There's an entire book in the Old Testament dedicated to nothing but hymns. The book of Psalms, all of them. Were sung. Now, we may today still debate what that meant and how that was done, but nevertheless, that was a book full of hymns. And I even love this verse from Matthew 26, verse 30. When Jesus was at the Last Supper with his disciples, after they had eaten, when they had sung a hymn, they went out to the Mount of Olives. So even Jesus in a gathering of his disciples, was singing a hymn. Now, all of these hymns that are, were in the Bible, that are in the Bible, are all Christ-centered. They were used as tools to help tell the story of Jesus. But as Christianity grew, there were battles being waged over what kind of lyrics and what kind of music constituted proper church singing. Sound familiar to anybody? <laughs> <laughs> now, like I said, we are covering hundreds of years per second here. Because by the fourth century, there were strong, stringent rules being placed regarding music in the church. Musical instruments, forbidden. They were associated with uh, idolatry and immorality. Singing was limited only to the clergy and the professional musicians. It was always done in Latin. And the more rules I put down here, the further apart music was being taken from the congregation. It started only being sung in unison. And any singing, music playing that did not conform to these stringent rules was considered a grave sin. And I should point out right now, Everything that we do musically in church today, including our hymn singing, our lovely pipe organ, our rock and roll band, all of it 
was at one time considered a sin. Eventually, over centuries, they decided another note could be added so we could hear two notes at one time, but they had to move in absolute parallel motion, and you had to say the same syllables all the time. Eventually, we reached polyphony, which meant many notes, and we were singing many notes at one time. But they still all had to go in the same direction, and they all had to be on the same syllable. Oh, and then, my goodness, we were able eventually then to sing different syllables at different times. My goodness, those crazy people. <laughs> But while congregational song was being stifled in the church, that does not mean that there were not hymns being written. Now realize, I just traveled us over 1,000 years of history. So in the 11th or 12th century, we have the O oh, Sacred Head Now Wounded. We all know that, one of our most loved Lenten hymns written during this time? Or how about the hymn we just sang last week? Jesus, the very thought of thee. Those words were written in the 12th century. However, I will point out that the music that we sing it to was written in 1866. <coughs> Keep those separate. Even all creatures of our God and King comes from St. Francis of Assisi in the 11th century. 11th century. Now, this is all in that time where congregational singing in church is forbidden, but people were still writing Christian music outside of the church. Well, all this gets us to the 14th century. My goodness, we've traveled a long way in a short time. And Martin Luther and his great reformation, his extreme proficiency in both word and song led to his being considered by many to be the father of congregational song. He believed music to be second in importance only to the word of God. Now, I want to give you a quote of Martin Luther's here, but I do want to preface this, that Martin Luther was just rude. Uh, he, he, was, he was brash. But he did say a sentence here that I want to keep with me. He rather humorously went so far as to say that anyone that does not consider music, and here begins the quote, as a marvelous creation of God, he must be a clodhopper indeed and does not deserve to be called a human being. <laughs> okay, I'll take that. Now, at nearly the same time, we had two other musicians influencing music in very different ways. Ulrich Zwingli in Switzerland continued, even though he was a great musician, continued to promote no singing in church whatsoever. So that in Zurich, Switzerland, not very far at all from where Luther was leading all this congregational song, no singing in church existed still more than 50 years after Luther's death, just right next door. Now, John Calvin, he existed somewhere in the middle. Uh, he believed in church and song, but only if it specifically and only quoted the word of God. So you could sing the hymns from the Bible. You could sing the words from Scripture, but nothing else. Well, folks, we're still practicing that today. There's an entire section of our brand new hymn book that's nothing but musical settings of the Psalms. We're still following that tradition today. So many great writers and composers have continued to contribute to our great library of music. And now I'm gonna share with you just a few stories of some of these hymns. Now I'll tell you that these stories I discovered in two books. One was Stories of the Christian Hymns by Helen Risk and Songs of Glory by William Reynolds, but I can tell you there are hundreds of sites and a dozen more books on my bookshelf that tell many of these stories. Now, you're right. I'm starting with Amazing Grace today. <laughs> we just sang. 
But I do want to take this opportunity to point out that when we talk about hymns, almost exclusively, ex nah, exclusively, we're talking about lyrics. When we mention a hymn, that's what we start talking about. But there are two separate elements to any hymn. First is the lyrics. Second is the song to which it is sung. Now, I will admit Amazing Grace is not the best example for this because the tune that we sing Amazing Grace to is, well, it's called Amazing Grace. But if you don't believe the concept of singing lyrics to different tunes, well, try this one on. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. Well, there's a good old 70s rock song, Peaceful, Easy Feeling. Or, you now you ready for this one? Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now am found, was blind, but now I see. That is Gilligan's <laughs> Island. Thus is how our hymn book works. Now, if you have looked in our bulletin, you will always see uh, out to the right of a hymn, a set of words that's in all caps. That is the song to which the lyrics are being sung. I find it really interesting. Oh, I jumped ahead, I, I jumped ahead. Um, I do wanna share one thought though about Amazing Grace. And that's where did that song actually come from? Word of Europe. We don't know. We really don't know where it came from, but it was written specifically for those words. And we know that John Newton wrote the words. So where did the music come from? Well, I'm going to give you a good guess here. Now, this is entirely supposition. But African music, not North American slave, which became gospel. Traditional African music uses what we call a pentatonic scale, which means it only uses five notes. Would you care to guess how many notes are in the melody of Amazing Grace? D, E, G, A, and B. They're the only five notes in the entire melody of Amazing Grace. Anybody want to make a really good bet that John Newton took a tune that he heard being sung in the bowels of his ships and used that as the foundation for Amazing Grace? I don't go quote me on this because there's no way anybody can prove that. But it seems a pretty good logical step that that's where that music actually came from. Now, speaking of associating words to music, I'm going to tell you a little bit about how firm a foundation. Now, this lyrics first appeared in a collection of hymns compiled by John Rippon in 1787. But the tune came from what we call the shape note tradition. Now, that was an example where they just put a shape such as a triangle or a square, or a circle, or a rectangle, or <coughs> all these different shapes. And each shape represented a different note in the scale. So all you saw on the page were these shapes with the notational value that looks like a quarter note or an eighth note. And so you were singing according to the shape, not by the lines on the page, which we use today. But there was such an aversion to singing to, with shape notes that, and I got this right out of our hymn book, up until the early 20th century, and that includes hymn books that many of you may have sung from. How firm a foundation was being sung to the tune Adeste Fidelis. Anybody know what hymn that is? That's O Come All Ye Faithful. How firm a foundation, ye saints of the Lord. Sue Weddington tells me that she remembers 
singing How Firm a Foundation to that tune because they didn't want to use shape note melody. But when we got away from using the shape notes and actually the notes on the page, then suddenly How Firm a Foundation returns to the tune that we sing it to today because we can find it the way we like to find it. How about the story of All the Way My Savior Leads Me? Now, this tells us of the great hymn writer, Fanny Crosby. Now, anybody know the affliction that she suffered from? Blind. She was blind. And one day, she was dead broke, had no money whatsoever. She was hungry. And she prayed, Lord, if you could just get me $5 today, just <clears throat> Five dollars is all I'm asking for, Lord. And there was a knock on her door. And it was an admirer of hers that just wanted to come and meet her and give tribute to the person he so looked up to. Do you know what he gave her? Five dollars. At that exact moment, Fanny Crosby began with the words, all the way. My Savior leads me. How about blessed assurance? Jesus is mine. That's a favorite of all of ours. Well, we're still talking about Fanny Crosby. Now, Fanny had a good friend named Phoebe Knapp. Now, Phoebe yeah. was a great composer. And you will go look up her name in our hymn book and find many songs and tunes that were written by Phoebe Knapp. But Fanny was visiting Phoebe one day, and Phoebe said, well, I've written this great tune. I just want to play it for you, and you tell me what it, what it says. Fanny Crosby immediately, without hesitation, said, blessed assurance, Jesus is mine. And Fanny immediately took... Uh, or uh, yes, Fanny immediately took Phoebe's melody and wrote that great hymn that we all know today. Good grief, I've got to hurry. How about <laughs> Hark the Herald Angels Sing? That hymn would have fallen into absolute obscurity because it was written at a time when hymns only were allowed to directly quote the word of God. And Hark the Herald Angels Sing doesn't do that. And when the hymn publishers realized that they had allowed this hymn to sneak into the hymn book, by accident, they did everything they could to pull it from the book and make it not be sung, but the people that had sung it already loved it so much that they couldn't do it. They couldn't get rid of it. It still might have fallen into obscurity had the tenor William Heyman Cummings not been warming up today to Felix Mendelssohn's The Festige Song. And if there's Germans in the room, I apologize for that. But he immediately recognized that this Mendelssohn tune perfectly fit the words, Hark the Herald Angels Sing. So if you look in your hymn book and you see the tune name that we sing that hymn to, it's called Mendelssohn. And that marriage of that tune and those words is what moved it to the fame that it has today. Speaking of earlier, holy, holy, holy. This hymn was specifically written by Reginald Haber for Trinity Sunday. He was looking for hymns that referred to specific Sundays of the year so people could sing about what they were studying that very day. The tune for that song was written by John Dykes. He was a noted English composer of the time. And when he wrote the tune, recognizing what the words were, he decided to name the tune that he wrote, Nicaea. Anybody want to know what that's a reference to? The Council of Nicaea that affirmed our belief today in the Trinity. It was from that meeting that came our Nicene Creed. We don't say it very often because it's really, really long. We do say the Apostles' Creed, which is a shorter version. So he named the tune that we sing, Holy, 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 to Nicaea. This is one of my favorite stories. Praise ye the Lord, the Almighty. The writer of this music was Joseph Neander. Now, Neander was a German composer, and he loved to walk 
in the Dussel Valley. The Dussel was a small tributary of the Rhine River. He loved to walk there and gain inspiration for his writing. He walked there so much that they renamed the Dussel Valley the Neanderthal Valley after his name. So Neanderthal, the Valley of Neander. It was some years later that a fossil of over 4,000 years old was discovered in that valley. They named it for the valley in which it was found. The Neanderthal man. So Joseph Neander has the great distinction of being the only hymn writer who has a fossil hominid named after him. <laughs> oh, there's so many more stories to tell, but my watch says I'm out of time. I do have to go meet the choir a little earlier. But this is one that I have to tell. I want to tell you the story of how great thou art. Now I can assure you this hymn comes from nowhere that you think. If you look in our hymn book, the tune that it is referred to is Ostorgut, a Swedish melody. How Great Thou Art started in Sweden. From there, it was discovered in Germany. It was translated to German and printed in a German leaflet. It crossed the border into Ukraine where it was printed in another pamphlet in Russian. Then an American missionary in the Ukraine saw this pamphlet, this Russian pamphlet. He took it with him back home to America where he happened to be following the Billy Graham crusade in Canada. So, in 1955, this American missionary from the Ukraine who found a Russian pamphlet handed this pamphlet to George Beverly Shea. And from that Swedish folk tune translated to German and Russian, Cliff Barrow and George Beverly Shea sang it first at the Toronto Billy Graham Crusade in 1955 and we think it's always just been ours mm -hmm. i do love that in our hymn book at the bottom of every single page is some little story about the hymn that you're reading notice there's always a tune name with a bunch of numbers after it that tells you the rhythm that any song can be sung to that hymn. The stories have been going on for thousands of years. And the stories of our Christian music as it continues to evolve from this grave sin that we do every time we open our hymn books and sing a hymn to the many ways in which we share the gospel of Jesus today. <clears throat> the stories will continue to evolve. And let us always remember that as we sing, we proclaim the glory of Christ. Amen. 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 Amen.